Hi everyone, this is David, and welcome to this review of a model paper for Writing 394, the Research-Based Business Report. Okay, here we begin, as we mentioned, with the transmittal letter. Let's bring it down, and, and as you can see, it is a single-page letter. It has some letterhead, because most business letters do, although letterhead is not required. Now, because this is a business letter, you must follow proper business letter format. After the letterhead, if there is any, comes the date. Then comes what's called the inside address. That contains the person's name and their full mailing address. Then comes the salutation. Because this is a formal letter, it's being followed by a colon. Now let's talk about what is in the transmittal letter. As you can see, it's very short. So that first paragraph is only one sentence long. And the purpose of that first paragraph, that first sentence, is simply to state the name of the document that you are delivering and why you are delivering it, because this person approved your proposal and asked for it. Then comes a middle paragraph that briefly, emphasis briefly, recap the content of the report. Why? To simply give the recipient more context about what it is that has just landed on their desk. They may have forgotten that this report was coming, so you remind them what it is. And then finally, in the last sentence or the last paragraph, that's your goodwill sentence. You want to thank the person for the opportunity. You want to thank any person who gave any special help to you, kind of an acknowledgement. And then you want to offer your assistance or recommend any steps uh, in your involvement going forward. Then that is followed by, as usual in a letter, the complimentary closing uh, sincerely is uh, standard for business letters, your signature, and then name in any title. So that is the transmittal letter, and that goes on top of the package. The next item in the package is the table of contents. Notice the heading on the table of contents is used in all caps. What else to say about the table of contents? The Names of the sections on the table of contents must match exactly the names of the sections in the body of the paper. The other thing that I would point out to you is make sure that you use leaders. Leaders are those dots that draw your reader's eye from left, the name of the section, to the right, which is the page number. And the third thing I would say about the table of contents is make sure the numbers on the right are aligned. There are several ways of doing that. Uh, find the best way that, that works for you. I think this student used a text box. You cannot visible. This is a PDF. But that is one way to get things in a line. Now, the next page is the executive summary. Notice that this is a major heading. Let's bring it down so that you can see the whole thing. Notice that the executive summary is about a half page long. That's because an executive summary follows what is called proportional length. Proportional length means that the shorter the body of the report, the shorter the executive summary. The longer the body of the report, the longer the executive summary. And usually the proportion is 10%. So if your body of the report is 10 pages, your executive summary should be one page and not any more. The body of your report is 20 pages. That means your executive summary would be two pages and not any more. Why? Because the executive summary is in miniature a replication of the full report. The executive summary contains the same parts as the full report in the same order, but, of course, highly distilled. The executive and executive summary refers to the decision or group of decision makers who often don't have time to read the full report and so will depend upon the executive summary on which to base their decisions, leaving the implementation to supernumeraries, underlings, 
to whom they will give the full report so that they can follow it. But then again, executives may also take time to actually get into the weeds with your report. Think of the executive summary as a kind of daily presidential brief. The president needs that list of bullet points. If the president deems it to be a really serious issue, the president may then jump right into the weeds and read more and more about the, about the report before making the decision. But the executive summary gives that busy executive the option as to whether or not to go ahead and make a decision without reading the report. Okay, the executive summary, you notice that we've got the problem. And by the way, if you use headings and subheadings in your executive summary, that's fine. Just make sure they do not use the same wording as the headings in your actual report. Then we have the methodology, how the problem was explore, explored, and then come the recommendations in bullet list. So that is the entire report in a highly distilled format. After the executive summary comes the introduction. What we want to notice here is the use of headings and subheadings. The major heading is in the middle. And notice that the introduction is at least two point sizes larger than the subheading directly beneath it, background. Also notice that as a major subheading, introduction is in the middle, as is overview of methodology. And the subheadings are on the left. Another thing to point out is the use of white space. The white space used to, to separate subject headings, subheadings, and body copy must be regular throughout the copy. If here I have background as a subheading and I've got a space and a half afterwards, then I must have purpose here which would be the same font size and uh, and font as background. I must have a line and a half afterwards, and then I've got my, uh, my single spacing for the body copy. That's just something to keep in mind when it comes to organizing the body of your paper, that it must be consistent. Consistent use of headings, consistent use of subheadings, and consistent use of white space. Okay, so there is the background, then comes the announcement of the purpose of the study, then an overview of methodology using a bullet list. Let's talk a little bit about the difference between a bullet list and a numbered list. First, both lists are things that you want to rely upon more rather than less in a business report. Lists prevent the reader from having to decode long blocks of text and prevent I, present items for quick scanning and skimming. Regarding the difference between a bullet list and a numbered list, in a bullet list, that means the sequence in which the things happened are not necessarily important. But in a numbered list, there is a reason why the two comes after the one and the three comes after the two. So please observe that difference. Then we have the methods. Again, notice that these major sections are each beginning on new pages. Notice also how the white space is kept regular throughout. Then comes the results. And here we have our use of sources. And these are in-text citations. Be sure to follow the APA style for your in-text citations. Let's take a look at this first one here. Let me pump it up so it can be seen. According to Owens 2006, the word Owens or the name Owens and 2006 comma constitute an in-text citation. The author's name does not have to appear inside the parentheses as long as it is a part of your sentence. Because this is a direct quotation, the page 163 appears at the end, and direct quotations must always have either page numbers or paragraph numbers follow, following them. One other thing to point out about in-text citations, notice how often Owens is used in this paragraph here. Owens is cited here, one. Owens is cited here, two. Owens is cited here, three. And then there is a sentence without any citation in it, and then Sullivan is cited here. 
which raises the question, how many times must you cite a single source, the same source, in a paragraph? And the answer is, as many times as you use it. This student used the source Owens three times in this paragraph, and therefore cited Owens three times. You only have to repeat the year of publication one time in a paragraph, but that repetition of Owens certainly had to be repeated as an in-text citation. So remember that a citation, an in-text citation, can only refer to the sentence that it is a part of. An in-text citation cannot refer to an entire group of sentences unless you use some kind of transitional device that makes it clear that that one in-text citation is covering those two or three sentences. You can say things like the author goes on to say and other kinds of transitional devices. After the secondary research comes the presentation of the primary research. And in the presentation of the primary research, we get into the presentation of figures. In APA, you label your figures sequentially. Here we have figure one, which is centered above the figure. And then below that comes a descriptive title of the figure. That's one thing I want to point out about the use of figures. The other thing I want to point out about the use of figures is that they should come as close as possible to their mention in the text. So let's take a look at the mention in the text. Here we is the figure below shows each question and whether the answer was correct or incorrect for each associate. That sentence does two things. It introduces the figure, but it also sets up the figure. It shows or tells the reader what to expect in that figure and how to interpret it. So you never simply plop figures down into your report without first telling your reader what they mean and how to interpret them. Then comes some more primary research. In this case, it's called memo analysis. And here we have another figure. Notice how it is also introduced. Figure 2 provides an example memo note left by a manager to one of the associates. It illustrates how problematic written communication can become. And there it is introduced by figure 2 and then its name or its title. And there is the actual figure. In this case, it's an illustration. Notice also how indention is used to further clarify, to provide even more white space, to make it even more easy for the reader to skim and scan through this document and pick up the important points. Continuing on, we have another list. Notice that the author first says Bell and Smith also suggest four questions, and so naturally we're going to use a numbered list here. Again, the use of indentation to further clarify, to further create highly visual chunks that make the reading of the document easy for a busy executive. After the primary research, the author then is, is going to begin making further analysis of the importance of clear writing in the workplace, bringing in secondary research, and then proposes a new template, and then gives four reasons why this new template is better. Now, where is this new template? This new template is in, you are told, Appendix B. Because it is a, a longer type document, as is the survey, and not a figure, you put those things in appendices. Let's scroll through to the appendices. They come after your references page. Notice that Appendix A is the training survey. Notice how long it is, therefore it would not fit as a figure. And notice that Appendix B is the assignment template. And notice how large it is, and therefore it would not fit as a figure either. So that's why the author is now comparing the old template with the new template because it has been referenced and the reader can go look at it in Appendix B. And that's how you use your appendices. After that analysis comes a clear set of recommendations. 
If I were to make a recommendation to this particular author, I would say use bullet lists more for your recommendations. But these are very short paragraphs and are not that difficult to read, but could be strengthened by the use of bullet lists. After the recommendations comes the list of references. Because this is a business document and everything else is single spaced or 1.15 spaced, for the sake of saving space, uh, again, everybody's in a hurry, uh, these references are uh, single spaced. Uh, notice also that you do have to observe the hanging indentation and you do have to observe the proper APA citation format. I do want to recommend to you the use of a citation maker and uh, my favorite is CiteFast and here is a look at CiteFast, its homepage and also here is a link to a video that shows you how to use CiteFast. By the way, CiteFast produces both in-text citations and reference citations, a very handy citation maker. And so after the appendices, which are numbered by Arabic, Arabic numerals in, in sequence with the rest of the document, that concludes our review. So there you go, the research-based persuasive report. Make sure that you look at it as a package. Make sure that all elements of the package are there in the order that you have been shown. Do all those things, review the model papers supplied, and you're going to be in great shape.